Today's video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive. Hi everyone, and welcome to today's video where we're going to be doing a guide for Denmark for EU4 1.34 Lions of the North. So with EU4 1.34 releasing along with the Lions of the North update, the whole region of Scandinavia, along with some of the Baltic nations and Poland and Lithuania have been updated with brand new mission trees, brand new events, lots of awesome fun stuff to do with them, along with the additions of new government reforms, new mechanics, nerfs and buffs to some ideas, and honestly I'm super super excited to be playing this DLC and I do like it quite a lot. I hope you boys will enjoy it as well. With that said, today we are going to be doing a guide on the nation of Denmark because I feel it is one of the strongest contenders in 1.34. As you know, Denmark starts off as a nation in Scandinavia, a region in Northern Europe, and we do start off as leader of the Kalmar Union, a union in which Norway and Sweden are our junior partners. We also start off with Holstein as a vassal, and we no longer own the province of Gotland because in this patch, Gotland is a independent nation. We do start off with a core on it though. Denmark also has a brand new mission tree. The top part right here focuses on conquest and getting the Kalmar Union junior partners in order along with fighting Sweden and these Baltic nations. And this bottom part right here mostly focuses on colonization in the New World, India and the East Indies and Africa as well. And then we have some other religious missions along with the branching missions right here. Denmark also starts off with a unique tier one government reform, the Kalmar Union, which gives us plus one possible advice and plus two diplomatic relations along with plus 15 nobility influence. I do like it, I do like the uniqueness of it, and I think it is actually pretty good. With all that said, you can sit back and relax and watch this guide to learn what you need to do as Denmark in 1.34. And before we begin, if you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to leave a like, and boys, consider subscribing, I'm trying to hit 100k subs, and maybe with your support, we can do it. Let's take a look at what we need to do as Denmark. Alright, alright, here we are as Denmark, and this is the situation at the start. Like I said, we do start off with these boys as our junior partners. Sweden has always been rowdy, it is still rowdy in this patch, and they'll get even more rebellious with all the events that they're gonna get, so it's definitely gonna be tough even for experienced players to keep Sweden under control. But more on that later. The first thing you're going to want to do as Denmark is go into your estates and summon the Diet. You can pick whichever agenda is best for you. Then we're going to give the clergy religious state, clerical advisory council, and religious diplomats. We're going to give the nobility primacy of the nobility, increased levies, and aristocratic counselors. And we're going to give the burghers land of commerce, patronage of the arts, commercial advisory board, and indebted to the burghers. Of course, in 1.34, you can have more than four privileges. And then we're going to seize land. The next thing we want to do is kickstart our mission tree. Obviously, we need to retake Goatland so we get some claims on some other stuff. We need to expand our military and navy to get claims on the Baltic nations. And we do need to rival and embargo England to get some bonuses to ships. So next, we're going to go into our rivals. And I recommend rivaling England, Novgorod, and then whichever nation you want. I'm going to rival Lithuania. We're not making that much money at the start, so I do recommend hiring just one advisor for now, and that should be a Diplo rep guy. If you don't have a Diplo rep guy, get whatever you want. I'd recommend an improved relations if you don't have him, but luckily I do have a Diplo rep guy. Next, we're going to try and find some allies, and ideally you'd want one big boy ally to help you around with some of the stuff over here, but as Denmark, you don't even really need allies. So just go into your alliances and check if you can link up with one of Austria, France or Castile. And in my case, it seems that I might be able to ally Austria here. So that's why I'm going to start improving relations with them. Like I said, an ally isn't necessary, but it's not bad to have either. Then with the other free diplomat, we're going to start improving relations with Sweden. And with the last guy, we're going to issue an embargo on England. Once we've rivaled and embargoed England, we can take the mission rival England, which gives us shipbuilding discounts and shipbuilding time minus 15%. Next, we need to deal with this mission, and this is how we're going to deal with it. We're going to construct four galleys right here in these four provinces, and we're also going to hire the free company in Copenhagen. This will take us a bit over force limit, but it's not a problem. Now it's time to wait for December 12th. At this point, you should also take your main army right here and merge your entire fleet and take them here. Once a few days pass, you will get this pop-up right here that a new leader arises in Sweden, and they're going to get Johan Vasa right here, 144 one he's not bad but he also adds liberty desire to sweden now we're gonna want to deal with this right away and the easiest way to lower their liberty desire at least temporarily is to dev up one of their provinces once or twice sure this is gonna cost us valuable points but we do want to deal with them so just go and see which province is the cheapest to dev in sweden i do think it should be stockholm and just bump it up once or twice just like that and now they're not rebellious anymore at this point you can also tell your subjects to siege 
Now, once December 12th hits, you're going to want to check who Goatland is allied to. And if they're not allied to anyone, you should go ahead and declare on them right away because, like I said, we do start off with a core on them. But in a bunch of my trial runs, I have noticed that Goatland does ally Lithuania super, super often. And that is also the case in my game right here. So if they've also allied Lithuania, just like in my case here, we're just going to wait for Poland to PU Lithuania and then we're going to deal with Goatland. Not a problem at all. But like I said, if they don't have any allies or someone super, super weak, like Stettin maybe, pounce on them right away on December 12th. Otherwise, we're just waiting for our boats to finish building. And if you're not fighting them during this point, you can lower army maintenance and turn off forts to save some money. At this point, if you're not fighting Goatland, you can get two more advisors. I'm gonna get this uh, tax guy right here, and I do recommend a morale or a discipline mill advisor. I don't have a level one one, so I'm just gonna get this reinforced speed guy. And at this point, you can rule Mary Holstein and improve relations with them. After a little bit of time has passed, you will get this pop-up telling us that the Kalmar Union will be dissolved if Norway and Sweden break free. And of course, it will dissolve if they break free. At this point, the Polish-Lithuanian Union has happened as well, and we can see that Poland has gotten Lithuania as a junior partner. This is pretty common. If it doesn't happen in your game, it doesn't influence the game too much, honestly. But right now, Goatland are left without an ally, as expected. But first, at this point, I can also ally Austria, which I will do. And like I said, if you can ally one of these three nations right here, the steel France or Austria, do it. But if you can't, no worries. It's not a big deal at all. And now that Goatland is left without an ally, I will be declaring war on them immediately. Of course, you are going to want to hire a general before this war, attach him to your main army right here. You can even send your mercs in if you want to, but the mercs aren't enough to siege down the level 3 fort. And of course, once the morale fills up on these guys, I'll be sending them in. You can also hire an admiral right now if you want to, but we don't really need one right at the start. And once your boats have finished building, you will also be able to take the mission Expand the Military. We gain an admiral with 50 tradition, so it's good if you haven't hired one yet. And of course, you shouldn't have. And we also get perma claims on Livonia, Estonia, and Coronia, which are these areas right here. And we'll be dealing with that as soon as we're done with Goatland. In 1.34, the AI is a lot better at naval invading, so expect your subjects to help you out as well. Now, if you want to pick a naval doctrine at the start, you can. Denmark does have a new unique naval doctrine, the Danish Admiralty, where we gain plus two naval leader maneuver and minus 10% admiral cost. Now, even though this is unique, I don't think it's better than some of these other ones. And I do still recommend galley combat ability right at the start of the game so it can help us deal with these guys right here easier with Novgorod too, maybe, and maybe even with Scotland later. But after you're done fighting those guys, you can easily swap to Merchant Navy for more trade power or shipboarding so you won't have to build boats. I am going to take three oarsmen here right at the start, but I'll probably be swapping later. Now, once Norway starts liking you a little bit more, and that'll be a year or two after the game starts, you will be able to take the mission The Crown of Norway, where the event Norway and the Kalmar Union happens. Now, for you to be able to unlock this mission, all you need to do is have Norway have more than 150 opinion of you and less than 20% liberty desire. You don't even have to do anything for these things to happen. The requirements for Sweden are a little bit different though, because they also need to have more than 150 opinion of us, which they should by now, but they probably won't have less than 10% liberty desire. You can get them down to less than 10% liberty desire, but you will need to dev their provinces quite a lot. And that is something we might do. However, more on that later. And of course, when you can take this mission, do it. And this is the Norway and the Kalmar Union event. The first option here, set the crown of Norway equal to our own crown, basically placates Norway and they will like us a lot more. We get minus 10% tax and plus 10 nobles influence, while Norway gets more tax income, more prestige and less liberty desire. So basically, we suffer a bit, but they like us more. We can also keep the status quo for 100 diplo points or degrade Norway into a Danish province instead, where we gain some really, really awesome bonuses, such as manpower recovery speed, plus 15%, plus 25% national sailors, and plus 25% goods produced, along with minus 15% nobility influence. However, this will make Norway as rebellious, if not more rebellious than Sweden. Now, if you feel like you're an experienced player and you can keep a hold of Norway, they won't break free. I recommend taking the great Norway into a Danish province instead for these awesome bonuses as long as they're still our junior partner and as long as we don't integrate them or something like that. However, for new ish players or new er players, I do recommend taking keep the status quo and just get 100 diplo points. Don't take this first option. It's the most detrimental to us. And really, we don't even need to get Norway any more loyal 
than they already are. I'm going to be taking this second option because it is slightly more beneficial to us and it is a slightly more difficult challenge. So let's degrade Nori into a Danish province instead and get those awesome bonuses as long as they're still our junior partner. Like I said, this will make them super disloyal, but Nori is a pretty small and weak nation, at least at the game start, so we should be able to keep them loyal. The Danish event should have similar options, but we're definitely not going to take that one that we just took with Norway. And even if Norway is slightly rebellious, it's not a problem. The nation you do want to try and keep loyal as much as possible is Sweden. And once the war with Gotland is over, of course, we are going to be full annexing them. Make sure you have them occupied and not Sweden. And that's that. No AE, nothing like that. It's already our core. And that's our most likely first war done. After we conquer Goatland, we will be able to take a mission, retake Goatland, where this event happens. Basically, you can gain some stability or release Goatland once again as a subject and they'll once again be a pirate republic. Of course, I recommend taking the first option. Now it's time to recoup and reconsolidate and get ready for our second war immediately, and this second war might be the first war for some of you, because we're going to be declaring on the Livonian Order. Of course, as you all know, these guys only ally Riga and the Teutons, so it shouldn't be nothing out of the ordinary. So, go ahead and take your entire army up here. At this point, you can start improving relations with Norway too. Once your army and navy are up here, it's time to declare war on the Livonian Order for the conquest of Reval. 99% of the time, maybe even 100, they're going to be allied to the Teutons. And as long as the two towns don't have any super powerful allies, you should co-belligerent them as well. These are the nations that are also going to get involved in my case. Now, even though we're fighting the Livonian Order here in our first or maybe second war, the most important provinces we actually want in this war are the provinces of Danig, Konigsberg, and Memel. These are all centers of trade and estuaries, and by owning these three provinces right here, along with Raval, we are going to become the dominant power in the Baltic Sea. So, as soon as you're ready, or as soon as you're done with Goatland, go ahead and declare on the Livonian Order for of all and co-belligerent the Teutons if they don't have strong allies. If they do have strong allies, don't co-belligerent them, but you should know that you're going to get a lot of AE from taking these three provinces. So maybe you'll take a little less from the Livonians. In this war, ideally, you should occupy these three provinces before December 1449, because as we all know, that's when Poland's truce with the Teutons expires, and we also all know that Poland loves to eat them up as soon as possible. If you get the State of Denmark event, I recommend going with the second option right here. And after this war is done, you've pieced out everyone else and full occupied the Teutons and the Livonians, here's what you're gonna take. So like I said, we are gonna be taking the provinces of Danzig, Konigsberg, and Memel from the Teutonic Order, and that's why it's super important to co-belligerent them, because they will cost a lot, it is a lot of aggressive expansion, and then from the Livonians, we are gonna take these provinces right here. Now, I did say declare for Reval, but some of you might feel like it's a little bit too much AE, and I'd agree with that. So, in fact, don't declare for Reval, just declare for one of these five provinces right here that I'm taking, and that's what we're doing, man. These provinces right here, so we block off the Teutons from anyone else conquering them, and these three provinces right here from the Teutons, because let's face it, we don't really care about these other ones right here. Poland can have them, if Poland doesn't take them, we'll take them later, and if not, no big deal. So, here's what we're taking in our Livonian Teutonic Order War. And of course, take as much money as possible. And that's our second, or if you didn't fight Goatland, your first war done. Now, this will generate quite a lot of AE, at least with these guys right here. So, it's time to chill a little bit, but it's no big deal either way, because we won't really be fighting any of these guys soon. So, now it's time to chill, go back, and get ready to fight Novgorod. Now, if we conquer all of these provinces right here, we will get claims on Novgorod and stuff like that. But I do feel like it's more important to take provinces from the Teutons in this war instead of following the mission. So now that we're done with this, we can go ahead and start a spy network on Novgorod. Alternatively, if Muscovy has taken both these provinces and you can't spy on Novgorod, what you should do is set the provinces that Sweden borders with Novgorod as provinces of interest, so Sweden will spy on them as well. And in my case, even Sapmi has popped out of Novgorod, I guess Muscovy made them do it. By this point, of course, Muscovy will have done their war with Novgorod, and everyone's Novgorod will look different, but of course, I will tell you what to do when you fight them. Now, by the time you're done with this war and own a little bit more land, Sweden should be fairly loyal, and they should have 200 opinion of you because you've been improving relations with them. So at this point, they should be between 20 and 30 Liberty Desire. At this point, I recommend improving their provinces to get them below 20 so we can get this mission done as well. And of course, once again, go ahead and check their cheapest provinces to develop. This one's 47 right here. So I'm just going to bump that up like twice and dip. And let's go ahead and see. And I'm going to bump it up 
twice in mil. And there we go, just like that, Sweden has dropped below 10% Liberty Desire, which means we can unlock this mission right here as well and get a similar type of event that Norway got. And the options are pretty similar to the Norway event. Right here, we get Denmark supports the pro-unionists and basically Sweden likes us more. They're more loyal. They get some bonuses to their nobles and tax, but we get minus 10% goods produced and plus 10% noble influence. The Norway one was tax. The second option is similar. Instead of 100 diplo, we gain 100 admin. And the third option is once again similar. We gain some awesome bonuses like minus 10% construction cost, plus 10% trade efficiency, land maintenance discounts, and goods produced, but Sweden will hate us. Once again, if you're an experienced player, I recommend taking this option for the bonuses as long as Sweden is our junior partner. But if you're a newish player or a player that wants to play a little bit more chill, you should take the second option. In my gameplay right here, I'm gonna take this second option and just gain 100 admin. I don't care about Sweden getting any more loyal, I've got them under control, but I don't want them to be very rebellious because then someone could support their independence and that might cause a lot of trouble. So for Norway, take the option to get bonuses for Sweden keep the status quo. Once you've started spying on Novgorod or told Sweden to spy on them, you should also set Scotland's provinces as provinces of interest, so hopefully Norway spies on them. If you're lucky, Scotland won't be allied or guaranteed to France, and if you're unlucky, well, you're just gonna have to wait for that to end. Let's see in my case, France and Scotland are actually at war. That's pretty surprising. I guess it's because France declared on Brittany, and uh, yeah. So in my case, Scotland isn't guaranteed or allied to France, in which case we're good to go. You can also delete the fort and goat land, we don't really need it. Once you've gotten tech 4 in all categories, you should activate encourage development in your capital state of, uh, I'm not gonna try and pronounce it, and you should bump up Copenhagen up to 30 dev. This will not only tick off the age objective and get us more splendor, but it'll also help speed up the spawning of the renaissance a bit. Once 10 years have passed, you can start annexing your subject Holstein. Don't give the nobility the nobility integration policy in order to not get the penalty because this will not only make Norway and Sweden more disloyal, but it's also redundant because we basically integrate Holstein for free thanks to this mission right here. As you can see, it says Denmark loses the annex subject modifier is present. So no messing around with the nobles, just annex Holstein regularly. Once you've cored up most of the provinces you took from these guys, it's time to move on with our next war. So take your armies over to Viborg along with your navy as well, because we're going to be fighting Novgorod. And sometime during the game, you're gonna get this event, the Swedish Dream of Freedom, where Sweden gains plus 50% Liberty Desire. This is gonna make them a bit rowdy, but it's not gonna be a problem to deal with, because pretty soon, we are gonna be taking Danish Subject Loyalty as our age ability, and they will lose all that Liberty Desire. And there we go, I've just integrated Holstein, we do get the Malice, as we can see right here, but as soon as we take the mission, we gain some points, and that Malice is gone. Awesome. And now that I've also integrated Holstein, I will be declaring on Novgorod, they don't have any allies, this should be a super, super simple war. For your tier 2 government reform, it's not so simple in 1.34. We can't just be strengthening noble privileges all the time. Well, maybe not in guides. Strengthen noble privileges and curtail are pretty much the same as well, but for monarchies, we do have three new tier 2 government reforms. We have grant noble castle rights, which makes constructing forts increase nobility loyalty by 5%, and we also get minus 20% fort maintenance. Now, this might be good as Switzerland, but it's not for Denmark. Then we have compromise with the nobility. This one is actually pretty good. As we can see right here, increased levies no longer increases influence and no longer decreases max absolutism. So basically, we can keep increased levies until the end of the game. And because they have such high land ownership, we already get 26% manpower from them. And then finally, we have a noble officer core, which gives us 2% nobility loyalty for every general we recruit and plus 0.5 yearly army tradition and plus 0.2 yearly army professionalism. These two, along with strength and noble privileges, I think are really good. You won't really be taking curtail or grant noble castle rights. Now, since as Denmark, we have plus 20% national manpower in our national ideas, and we got a lot more from increased levies as well, I don't think we really need strengthened noble privileges for even more manpower. That's why as Denmark, for your tier 2 government reform, I recommend taking compromise with the nobility. The minus 10% stab cost is nice, but the main draw with this government reform is increased levies not giving us any bad things like nobles influence and lower max absolutism. So it's basically 
free plus 25% national manpower as long as the nobility still have high land ownership. Later in the game, once you pass through all of the reforms, you could swap to strengthen noble privileges. But up until the 1650s, compromise with the nobility for your tier 2 government reform. And once your war with Novgorod is done, here's what you're gonna take. Like I said, Novgorod will look differently for everyone else because Muscovy will have fought them already. But what you basically want to do with Novgorod here is take as much land as you can to create a sort of a border with Muscovy so Muscovy can't take any more land from Novgorod. In my case, they're already pretty small, so I can annex them completely, except for this one province right here that I can't get. But if you can't full annex them, you should take like something like these three provinces and then this over here to prevent Muscovy from taking the rest. But of course, take as much as you can. And I'm going to be almost full annexing them. And that's our first and probably only war with Novgorod done. This'll likely have been your third war, just like me. Ideally, you'd also have this province right here too, but in my case, Muscovy took it. Not a big deal, this is the most important one. Even if you can't get this one, don't worry, just fight them and take as much as you can. Like I said, they'll look different for everyone. I'm just gonna declare a quick little opportunistic war here on Sapmi since they have popped out, and this is something that may or may not happen in your campaign, but they don't have any allies, so why not go for it? And of course, I am going to be full annexing these guys. They're only one province. Once you get to around the 1460s, I do recommend lowering autonomy in every province that you can. Of course, lowering autonomy will increase unrest, but we will get a lot more money, trade power, and manpower. Now, once you conquer these provinces from Novgorod, depending on how many or how little you've conquered, your religious unity will go down because these are orthodox provinces, and we really don't have enough missionary strength to convert all of them. We will be doing that later during the Age of Reformation, no matter if you stay Catholic or go Protestant or Reformed. So what I recommend for now, or until the end of the game if you want to, is to trade company all the provinces that are Orthodox, mainly in the White Sea and Novgorod trade node. So just click on the trade node and go right here and assign all those provinces to a trade company to negate all those religious unity penalties. Of course, the month needs to refresh, and now we don't have any religious disunity. After you've dealt with Novgorod, if Poland has these areas right here, or maybe if Danzig has popped out, you should start spying on Poland or Danzig, it doesn't matter who owns them, and get some claims on these provinces right here. For your first age ability, if you're having trouble getting Sweden and Norway loyal, you should take Danish subject loyalty. Otherwise, you should take Justified Wars. I'm gonna take Danish subject loyalty for the purposes of this guide, even though my guys are fairly loyal. It may help out with some missions. And a little tip I'd give you guys for when something like this happens, don't beat up your subjects rebels and stuff like that, unless of course they're separatists or pretenders, most importantly. If they get nobles or someone like that, let them deal with it. They'll use up their manpower and they'll be weaker and they'll be less rebellious. Personal union subjects don't give you any money anyway, so it doesn't matter if these guys give them increased autonomy or something. After you've dealt with Novgorod, there are several routes of expansion. You could either try and fight Muscovy if they're pretty weak, which they shouldn't be at this point. They'll usually get weaker after they annex most of their subjects. You can wait for your truce with the Livonia in order to expire and fight them. You can check and see if Poland and Lithuania are weak. Maybe you could fight them if you've allied Austria just like me. Or, the best case scenario would be to actually fight Scotland. Now, in my case here, Scotland isn't guaranteed or allied with France, and they've already lost to England, but luckily, Norway has managed to get a claim on one of their provinces. So I could totally fight them, vassalize them, reconquer their course from England, or whatever else we want to do. Now, this is an opportunistic war that you may not get in your campaign. So don't worry if this doesn't happen to you. If you can't fight Scotland because they're allied to France or guaranteed by them, don't worry about it. This is not something that's strictly necessary. So check and see which one of these neighbors right here is the easiest to fight. Like I said, it's going to be Muscovy, the Livonians, Riga, or Poland, Lithuania, and maybe Scotland. Once you get to Admin Tech 5, you will be able to unlock your first idea group. Now, obviously, the mission tree of Denmark and sort of our national ideas want us to colonize, and we will be colonizing. But my recommendation is when you play with one of these northern nations, for example, England, Denmark, Norway, someone like that, my recommendation is to not start off with exploration expansion. This is because no one will really colonize North America anyway, and we got plenty of time to get into Africa, India, and the East Indies, so I don't actually recommend opening up with exploration expansion. I recommend those two idea groups for your third and fourth one. Of course, you can take them as your first two. This is a totally valid strategy, but what I'm gonna do in my guide here is not open up with exploration expansion. Instead, I feel like we need to buff up our army and maybe navy even more. So what I recommend for your first idea group as Denmark 
if you're not doing exploration expansion, is quality or offensive. Quality will buff up our army significantly with all these combat modifiers, since we don't really have a lot of those international ideas, and offensive is really good too for the force limit, discipline, siege ability, and all the bonuses to generals. Of course, quality also gives you even more bonuses to boats, so I'm gonna go with quality for my first idea group. So quality, offensive, or if you want to start colonizing right away, exploration. You should focus on mill after you've gotten it or on dip if you've gotten exploration. Now, since a little bit of time has passed, I will be declaring my next war, and like I said, it's this opportunistic war versus Scotland, since they don't have any allies. I'm gonna be vassalizing them, and then probably reconquering their course from England, if I can get strong enough to fight England, because they have allied Portugal and Castile, which has Aragon and Naples. So, maybe I'll just be left with these few provinces for a little bit of time. Either way, I'm gonna be declaring on Scotland right here. Like I said, if you can't fight them, don't worry. And once again, shout out to the AI for knowing how to naval invade man an awesome awesome addition to this update and over here it seems that estonia has popped out of the livonian order due to separatists this is a perfect little opportunity just like we had with sapmi sure it's one province but why not take advantage of it because we do have a claim from our missions and they don't have any allies keep an eye out for stuff like this you could get them in your game as well nice little event right here and my war with Scotland is pretty much done, and of course you're gonna take as much as you can from them. If they're small-ish like this, if you're fighting them, try and vassalize them to get their cores back from England. However, if they're intact, you're gonna want to take something like this maybe to prevent England from pushing into them further. So try and take these two border provinces that they previously owned with England right here. Of course, like I said, I'm gonna be vassalizing them just like that so we can reconquer their cores, but I'm also gonna take the province of Ulster here for myself to provide a route for expansion into England, along with all their money. Like I said, this isn't something that you're necessarily gonna do, but it's nice if you can take advantage of it. Now, even though we start off in a good position as Denmark, we were pretty poor at the start, and I'd say about 15 to 25 years into the game is when you actually start making some real money. Right now, I'm making a ducat, sure, but when I'm gonna be at peace, we're probably gonna be up to eight ducats or something like that. And now that I'm done with Estonia, of course, I'll be full annexing them. Once you've paid off all your burger loans, and I just did that in my case since I did have a bunch of regular loans as well, and like I say boys, don't be afraid to play with loans, alright? They're a tool that you can use to get even more powerful. So, now I'm just gonna get new burger loans, of course they will be bigger than they were previously, because we are bigger ourselves, and I'm gonna use these loans to construct the most important building you can build in the early game, and that is the marketplace. Of course, a general rule of thumb is to build marketplaces in all centers of trade and estuary provinces, but maybe also provinces that you've dubbed up quite a lot in production and that give you more than two right here. So of course, I'm going to build one in Copenhagen right here. Let's put one right there as well. Danzig 2, Konigsberg, Memel, Goatland, and apparently in uh, that province right there as well. I'm going to build one in Reval as soon as I core it. Of course, if you have a little bit of money left over, after you've built the marketplaces, start upgrading these centers of trade to tier 2. When you get the strategic marriage event where you need to give Orkney to Scotland, don't do it. Of course, I do have them as a vassal and it won't change a lot if I do give it to them, but choose this second option. We'll never give up our claim to these lands. With that, Norway gets some claims on this, but they've already spied on it, so it's no big deal. Around the late 1460s, or depending on when you fought the Livonians, your truce with them should be up. And it's time to declare our second war against them, where we're going to finish the annexation of the Livonian Order. But in this war, we're also going to take the province of Riga. Now, fighting Riga isn't hard, but it is super annoying because they're always in a trade league with Lubeck. And you're going to have to fight all of these guys right here, which is going to be very, very annoying and very, very long. In my case, they've also allied Poland, which is going to make it even more difficult. So what I recommend is just simply full annexing them without even co-belligerenting them. So I'm going to declare on the Livonians for the conquest of whatever and fight them and Riga. You should be doing the same, of course. And just like that, my second war with the Livonians is done. And like I said, in your second war, you're going to full annex them. Of course, assuming they still exist, which they should since we blocked them off from other nations nations and you should also annex the province of Riga and with that we're done with the conquest of this area and you will be able to take this mission right here reconquer Estonia where we gain Estonian as an accepted culture or if there aren't enough slots we gain 100 diplo points and we also gain some perma claims on some stuff that we need to conquer from Novgorod or Muscovy like this right here and delete some of the forts around here we don't really need all of them i just left the ones in konigsberg and uh, riga if you've conquered something in ireland when fighting scotland it's not a bad idea to spy on some of these guys right here as well depending on who is the weakest of course once again anything you do in england is just a bonus and totally not necessary when you get around to some cash i do recommend bumping up your navy quite significantly i've built up two more galleys and i'm building three more heavies 
and you should also construct a flagship when you do have the cash. We do want to check off these requirements to rival the English Navy. Looks like France got themselves in a little bit of a coalition, huh? After you've dealt with this whole Livonian order area, taken the provinces from the Teutons, fought Novgorod, and maybe fought Scotland as well, it will be time for your first big war, which is most likely gonna be versus Poland. Now, Poland shouldn't have any strong allies. You guys know that they usually get Lithuania, maybe Moldavia and Danzig too. In my case, Hungary got Moldavia, but they could sometimes ally someone strong, like France, for example. I have seen that a couple of times. Not in this patch, though. In my case, they're only allied to Brunswick right here, and they have Lithuania as a junior partner. Now, you should be able to take on Poland-Lithuania yourself, depending on how strong Sweden and maybe even Norway are, and your army should be pretty big by this point as well. But to make things easier, you could always call in one of your boys as long as they're willing to help you out. And let's see right here, in my case, I think I should be able to call in Austria, and if you can call in Austria, that's going to be an awesome help. But like I said, you can do it by yourself. Now, in my case here, Austria actually has the attitude towards enemies modifier, which means that they wouldn't join. But there's a very easy way to make them not have it. The first thing we're going to do right here is go down to the favors tab and ask them to reduce their opinion of Poland for 10 favors, just like that. It'll decrease by 100. And we're also going to ask them to prepare for war for another 10 favors. And as we can see, now Austria would accept because they are prepared for war and they don't like Poland that much anymore. So if you're ready to do this, go ahead and declare on Poland. You can do it by yourself, but it's nice to have help. And just declare for some of these provinces right here, which you should have spied on, like I said earlier. I'm going to declare for Malborg. The provinces we're focusing on in this war are the provinces in the Baltic Sea trade node that Poland or Danzig should own, and maybe the provinces in the Baltic Sea trade node that Lithuania owns. There's gonna be a bunch of events like this in the early game where Sweden gains some liberty desire. This is part of the Swedish independence event chain. When you get the Brewing Revolution of Sweden event, don't pick this first option. You're gonna have a lot of trouble with these uh, 60k pretenders that are about to rise up in Sweden. And Sweden is most likely gonna break free from you. Now we are gonna do this second option right here, and this one may also be costly, but it's just something we're gonna have to deal with. And these are the modifiers that we get, but I still think it's better than dealing with 60k pretenders. For your tier 3 government reform, it's once again not as simple as it was in previous patches because we have 4 additional tier 3 reforms for monarchies. Now you already know centralized bureaucracy, but now it's a centralized monarchical bureaucracy and along with the autonomy change we get minus 10% culture conversion cost, minus 25% autonomy change cooldown which is super nice and all states loyalty equilibrium minus 5%. Decentralized is pretty much the same, max promoted cultures, minimum autonomy, then we have expanded royal court which gives us plus one possible advisors and plus 20% reform progress growth. This one is pretty nice as well. Then we have royal favoritism, which disables calling the diet and reduces the loyalty loss from seizing crownland by 5%, and we get minus 10% cost of advisors with ruler culture. This one is pretty good as well. Then we have regional councils. We get age unique state edicts, and I'm gonna be honest, I haven't checked those out yet, along with minus 33% state maintenance and representatives of the crown, where vassals and marches gain a 25% increase in tax, and we get diplo relations and vassal force limit. Now, as Denmark, I still think that centralized monarchical bureaucracy will be the best option, although if you do want to play around with these newer ones, you should go for expanded royal court for that reform progress growth, because now we do have 10 reform tiers, or you can go with royal favoritism for that cost of advisors with ruler culture, but then again, you won't get the diet. So what I recommend for your tier 3 government reform is centralized monarchical bureaucracy. And once you've beaten up Poland sufficiently, here's what I recommend taking from them. Like I said, it's the provinces and the Baltic Sea trade node. That is what's most valuable to us. So I'm going to take these provinces right here from Poland. A is not bad. And these four provinces from Lithuania, 58 AE. But as we can see, these nations would join a coalition. But a coalition won't form because we need four nations to join it. And Poland can't because we'll have a truce. And we won't really be fighting Catholics anytime soon so this is all good so take these provinces right here for sure and if you're comfortable with the aggressive expansion take the ones from lithuania too then you can also take war reps and as much money as you can and that's our first war with poland 
done. At this point, you're really gonna start racking up cash, so make sure to invest all of that into building workshops. I recommend building workshops in high value trade good provinces. I would build one right here since it produces iron, even though I won't get that much money from it right now. This is pretty much building for the future. So of course I'm gonna put one in Danzig right here and Konigsberg, the provinces with gems. After you've fought Poland, it's time to chill for a little bit, wait for aggressive expansion to die down before moving on other conquests, and during this time you're gonna wanna build up your army, build up your navy, and construct buildings of course. And like I said, definitely build a flagship as well, we do need it for our missions. What I recommend is building a heavy with mass load cannons, we do have Scandinavian flag officers right here, which has a monthly chance of Admiral skill gain on mission plus 3%, so one of his pips could increase. But what I like to go with here is definitely mass load cannons, fleet morale, and then maybe flagship durability, movement speed, blockade on siege, or engagement with. I'm gonna go with these three right here, but you can play around and choose whatever you want. Definitely go for mass load cannons though. Once you do fulfill all the requirements that challenge the English Navy, you will be able to take the mission and gain 20 naval tradition along with permaclaims on these areas in England right here. Of course, right now I still don't feel like I'm strong enough to take on England because they are allied to Portugal and like I said Castile that has Aragon and Naples. Maybe your alliance network will be a little more lucky than mine, maybe you'll have all of Scotland by now, and maybe you'll be able to take on England if they don't have strong allies like in my game too. If this is an opportunity you can explore, definitely go for it and definitely take out England. I can't do it in my game yet. An alternative way you could fulfill the mission if you don't conquer Lubeck is by gaining 30% or more trade power in the Lubeck trade node, which I have just done because I built up some more marketplaces and I upgraded these two centers of trade. So now even even if I haven't conquered Lubeck, I can take this mission right here, where we gain 20% trade efficiency, 20% global trade power, and 10% trade steering for 30 years, and something very fun happens. A decision is enabled which will trigger a trade conflict war between us and the Hanseatic League, basically Lubeck and all their boys, and we will be the defender. This is a very, very fun scenario, and let's see right here what happens maybe I can get lucky and get into this war. So, either gain 30% trade power in Lubeck or annex them to trigger this. And this is the decision that has popped up, provoke Hanseatic trade conflict. And as we can see right here, we either need to have a trade conflict CB or declare an embargo on the nations which own certain provinces, and basically those nations are Stettin, Lubeck, Hamburg, and Bremen. So what I'm gonna do right here is embargo all of those guys so you can see how this works. And there we go, I've embargoed Lubeck, Hamburg, and Bremen. Of course, these are costly trade embargoes because they're not my rivals. But let's go ahead and take this mission right here where we can provoke the Hanseatic trade conflict and see what happens. And just like that, we've been declared on by all of these guys that are pretty much in the Hanseatic League, and now we're defenders against these nations. Now this is going to be a super easy war, very easily winnable, and since you're a defender, your allies will automatically join if you have any, like I said it's not necessary, in my case Austria and Bohemia have already joined. And honestly boys, this is one of the best wars that you can do, fighting the Hanseatic League HRE members without getting the Emperor in. You see, this is a trade conflict war, but we can still full annex all of these nations that we're fighting. Now, of course, I took this decision now in order to demonstrate it for you guys and how everything works, but what I actually recommend you guys do is wait until AE with the HRE guys is pretty low and then get into this war because you will be able to full annex all of these guys that own super, super nice provinces. And the most important guys you're gonna wanna take are Bremen, Hamburg, and Lubeck. The owner of Stettin right here isn't that important. This province isn't that high value, but these three provinces are some of the best in the game for trade. When you're at war with these guys, you'll also be able to take the mission the cities of Hansa, which gives us 20 prestige, two mercantilism, four years worth of trade income, and some trade power in Rhineland and Saxony. Awesome. Of course, when you embargo these guys, make sure to revoke it after the game starts because they are costly trade embargoes. And now because Sweden likes me enough and apparently they have completed the Swedish Dream of Independence event chain, which of course already started, I can now take this mission, the Nobles of Sweden, where Swedish pretend rebels will no longer rise against Denmark and our current ruler gains 2 mil points, however if it's over 6 it'll get converted to 100. Now my guy right here is pretty old, so I wouldn't waste this mission on him normally, I would save it until I get my new ruler in charge, but I am gonna take it right here just so you guys see what happens. 
and there we go now his stats have increased after you've taken this mission sweden shouldn't be a problem anymore for your second idea group if you opened up with exploration you should of course go with expansion but since i opened up with quality what i recommend for your second idea group if you also opened up with quality or offensive is either economic or diplo this is your choice if you're not going colonial at all though your second idea group should be trade so i'm gonna go with economic here now when your first ruler dies in my case my guy just did you will get this event the new arch queen in my case since it's a woman but in your case it could be the arch king where this happens we either need to assume power directly and maybe norway and sweden will reject our king or queen and elect their own which could result in them breaking free or we could grant our subjects as nobles additional privileges where we lose some tax and get minus 10 percent vassal force limit contribution and if they're rebellious they gain some bonuses here however if they have less than 10 percent liberty desire they will never reject your king or queen or if they have more than 90 they will always reject so when you get this event make sure to check your subjects as liberty desire sweden and norway in my case they're both below 10 which means i can super safely take this first option our junior partners will love margaret the second if one of these guys is over 10 when you get this event when your first ruler dies make sure to try and pay off their debt or something like that like i just did right now or dev up a few of their provinces so their liberty desire will get lowered so when they're below 10 you can safely choose this first option and there we go norway and sweden have both accepted their new ruler once your war with the Hanseatic guys is done, what I recommend doing is taking as much as you can based on aggressive expansion. All three of these provinces are similar in value, so you can take whichever one you want. I do recommend Lubeck the most, so I am going to piece out Lubeck right here. Boom, just like that. Next, I'm going to piece out Hamburg. A coalition might form, but it probably won't. And let's see what happens if I want to full annex Bremen. Will a coalition form? A little coalition might form. So let's wait until January. And there we go. Now that it's January, I'm going to check. And the less nations will enter the coalition. So I'm going to full annex Bremen as well. Like I said, if you can take all three of these provinces, do it. But if not, try to take at least one. It's totally up to you. Once you've dealt with both of these missions right here, especially the nobles of Sweden, you will probably be able to fulfill the mission, ratify the Kalmar Union very easily as well. In my case right here, all I need is stability of at least three. So as soon as I get the admin points, I'll stab up and show you what happens. And by the way, the war I just showed versus the Hanseatic League, do it whenever you want. Just make sure AE is low with these guys. You don't have to do it now. You could do it in 50 years if you want to. And now that I have enough admin points, I'll stab up purposely to show you guys what happens when we take that mission. But looks like I need to beat up some subject rebels first. And actually, Norway got there before me. Once again, kudos to the AI for learning how to naval invade. They are really good in this patch. And when you take the mission Ratify the Kalmar Union, we gain a level 2 center of trade in the Lund province. And this one gets upgraded to a max level 2. But most importantly, we get this event, the ratification of the Kalmar Union. You should be able to complete all the requirements for this event by around the 1520s max. I feel like it happened right now for me. So look what happens. We abolish the Kalmar Union government reform. Basically, we stop being this right here. And instead, we become the unified Kalmar monarchy, tier one government reform. With this government mechanic, junior partners receive the bonuses of a march so basically they become heavily militarized and for each junior partner we gain plus 4k manpower plus 2k sailors plus 5% manpower and plus 5% sailors so we get that times two because of Norway and Sweden we also gain plus one possible advisors just like right here plus two diplo relations just like right here but we also get plus 10 max absolutism and minus 40 years for personal union integration. Super nice. And just like that, we're the unified Kalmar monarchy. Another super awesome, super unique feature for the whole Kalmar union and especially Denmark. Now all you need to do to form Scandinavia is integrate Norway and Sweden and then you'll be able to unite it. And by around the 1490s, your realm should look a little something like this. Basically, we started off as Denmark and got to conquering real quick by fighting Goatland if we could. If not, you should have waited for them to break their alliance with Lithuania, which like I said, happens pretty often. Then we got into war with the Livonian Order and took these border provinces from them to prevent other nations from pushing into them and also took the three most important provinces from the Teutonic Order. After we wrapped up Goatland and these provinces right here, we pushed into Novgorod. Of course, like I said at the start, they will look different for everyone else, but you should have taken border provinces to prevent Muscovy from pushing into them further and maybe full annex them if you could. If not, you should have taken care of them 
later. And then you could have had an opportunity to declare on Scotland, like I said, if they weren't allied or guaranteed by France, which in my case did happen, and maybe if they were small like in my case, you vassalized them, or if they were big, once again you took border provinces to prevent England from pushing into them further. Of course, we didn't do that many wars, we were focusing on keeping Norway, keeping Sweden, there was lots of various events and missions we had to deal with in order to prevent the collapse of the Kalmar Union, and of course we did one, maybe two big wars, if you fought Muscovy as well, I haven't in my case, I will do it soon, but you should have definitely fought Poland and Lithuania to take the other Baltic Sea provinces that they owned. And of course, if aggressive expansion in the HRE was low enough for you, once you annexed Lubeck or got 30% trade power in the Baltic Sea, you could have taken the mission the cities of Hansa or humiliate Lubeck, I forgot which one it was, so the decision popped up where these Hanseatic guys declared war on us, and depending on your aggressive expansion, you should have taken one to three of these provinces right here. I pieced out Stettin for some other stuff right here, actually it was Mecklenburg, but yeah one of these three provinces at least maybe all three of them like in my case and by this point you may have worked your way down this mission tree right here if everything was in order if you got sweden loyal and to like you or maybe you could do it a bit later but you should be reaching the mission ratify the kalmar union and you may be the unified kalmar monarchy by now at this point i'm the number four great power you'll be somewhere around here as well based on everything you've conquered you may be a little more powerful if you've gotten more of scotland than me and you may be a little less powerful if you didn't get scotland or didn't get as much from Novgorod. By this point, you should be one of the most powerful nations in the world. This is what my navy looks like. I've got six heavies, including the flagship, 16 galleys, 10 transports right here in the main fleet. And I do have this little trade fleet protecting trade in Lubeck. You could build up more trade fleets, put them in the North Sea, put them in the Baltic, put them in Novgorod, wherever you want to. My army consists of 24, 4, 7 right now. I feel like that's pretty good composition, at least for now. And as we can see, I'm making about 35 ducats right here with army maintenance lowered, of course. If I raise that and activate forts, it's 25 ducats, which is still super, super strong. We're already making 32 ducats from trade. Of course, conquest and keeping a hold of the Kalmar Union isn't the only thing you should have been doing during this time. You should have been improving your nation economically, devving a few provinces here and there. Copenhagen should be more than 30 dev by now, and you should have more marketplaces in all the center of trade and estuary provinces, production buildings in all the high value trade good provinces. I am building some barracks right now to improve my manpower even further and obviously you guys can see that we didn't even need strength and noble privileges. I got a few churches here and there and that's pretty much and that's pretty much the situation as far as buildings go. I've upgraded most of my centers of trade to level 2. I will continue to upgrade them. You should do the same. And because you'll be rolling in cash, you will have the opportunity to upgrade a bunch of great projects. You should definitely have three by now. This one, this one, and this one. And you may have the one in Neva. And of course, later you're going to get these two right here from Norway and Sweden. None of them are really good. We got the Kronborg right here. This is a new one. It's basically naval combat and mercantilism and trade stuff. We got the Visby city right here. More trade power. This one's actually pretty good. You can do the Malborg castle as well. This is basically for army stuff. And the Winter Palace is good for absolutism and reform progress growth. Although all the way at tier 3. So no really amazing monuments. But when you do have the extra cash, bump these guys up. They won't hinder you. In fact, they'll help you just not very significantly now of course we do have all the new government reforms and the video would simply be too long for me to go through all of these and explain what each of them do so i'm just gonna tell you what to take as denmark here in this scenario for your tier 4 government reform you should take expand temple rights for plus 33 percent tax when you build a temple or a church and minus 10 percent admin advisor cost for your tier 5 government reform you should go for meritocratic recruitment you already know cheaper advisors or dynastic administration especially for that plus one monarch admin skill for tier 6 you should take royal decree for tier 7 you should take curtail the burgers or mercantilistic approach for all the trade company bonuses if you're going colonial and expanding into india and southeast asia however if you're not going colonial i recommend this one that i'm not gonna try and pronounce for tier 8 you should take the six livers of the republic for tier 9 you should take a kingdom for the people for plus one policies so you'll have four instead of three or if you're not into that one that much you should go with la tasemwa for govcap and if you took kingdom of the people for plus one possible policies for tier 10 you should take legislative houses for plus one free policies however if you took la tasemwa 
you should go with political absolutism. If you opened up with exploration expansion, you should go with quality and economic. If you opened up with quality and economic, you should then go exploration expansion, and then the final four idea groups are up to you. And of course, when the Protestant Reformation comes around, I do recommend going Protestant as Denmark. And after this point, you're just gonna continue to expand in the same areas we've already been expanding. You're especially gonna wanna push into Muscovy to take a hold of the Novgorod trade node. You may push into Poland and Lithuania some more to get some of their valuable provinces, at least in this area right here. And later, when you become too powerful for the HRE, you can try and get yourself elected emperor, or you can fight the HRE and try and take over the provinces in the Lubeck trade node. And of course, you should take every opportunity to get into the British Isles and completely dismantle England and take a hold of the entire Britain region as well as the English Channel trade node over here in France and the Netherlands. And that's about as much as your extent in Europe might go. Basically, these trade nodes up here, whereas in the New World, you're going to want to colonize North America, get some trade companies in Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And like I said, Baron, the 1490s, your realm should look a little something like this. And boys, with all that said, make sure to check out the link in the description or in the pinned comment to get Lions of the North for yourself and play this awesome, awesome update that has added so many things to Denmark and not just Denmark but the entire Scandinavian and Baltic regions super super fun DLC I think it's one of the best ones that Paradox has made ever and I'm super excited to play with it some more so make sure to check it out thank you once again to Paradox Interactive for sponsoring this video let me know in the comments below what's the next nation that I should do a guide on if you want to watch me do stuff like this live you can follow me on twitch.tv slash the Red Hawk live and if you want to catch up on stuff from over there you can subscribe to the second channel link is in the description if you enjoyed this video don't hesitate to leave a like it really helps out a lot and if you want to see more guys like this or more you for videos in general definitely hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on anything and you can become a member today and join the discord the link is in the description thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time with another eu4 video